Streaming subscriptions are becoming so plentiful that you might be getting a sense of deja vu. Wasn't this the reason we stopped buying cable in the first place? But the advent of channels called Something Something Plus are also harking back to the classic era of Hollywood in ways that will alter the future of entertainment production and consumption for the worse. We've already seen how the likes of Marvel and Disney are designing their temple films with content in mind. Even Sony is incorporating memes into their big releases. And it seems the world where trailers get trailers isn't going away anytime soon. But that's just the stuff we're allowed to see. There's more happening behind closed doors that might make you rethink selling your DVD box set at your next yard sale. So should we be worried about the direction of the entertainment industry, or is this paranoia just a case of Chicken Little? Well, it's time to learn how history works as we turn back the clock to examine why streaming is old Hollywood's Trojan horse. The first reason you should be worried is because of what the old Hollywood system was like. Historians refer to it as the studio system. The decline started in the 40s when the American government stepped in to break up the practice of block booking. You see, each of the big five studios, which at the time was Paramount, MGM, Fox, Warner Bros, and RKO, owned their own theater chains. For those they didn't own, they used block booking. This meant offering one good movie on condition that theater owners also show inferior products. This all or nothing approach meant studios could exploit theater owners to help make money on bad productions. It would be like telling a cinema owner that they could only screen The Dark Knight if they also showed Freddy Got Fingered. It also meant they could push out pictures from companies that didn't have ownership of cinemas. This included the smaller studios like Universal, Columbia, and United Artists, but also any independents. It would be like if your internet service provider prioritized access to sites that they made. The breakup of this monopoly was stalled during World War II, so that the studio system would be used for propaganda purposes, but by the 1960s, the Big Five had been forced to sell off their chains. A lot of B-movies bit the dust, which were often training grounds for contracted actors and crew. However, it did level the playing field. Now, the market could truly decide what to see. If an indie film was more popular than some big movie studio, then theater owners could give the audiences what they wanted. But now, major studios are building their own streaming platforms. Defenders will point out that this isn't an exact replica of the banned block booking practice. But one might say that you can do something in the letter of the law, but not in the spirit of the law. For starters, the sheer scale of productions by Disney Plus and Netflix means block booking cast, crew, and studio space. But the big issue is the gutting of theater owners. Now, many big movies debut at the cinema and on home screens at the same time. We're nearing the stage where the revenue generated from streaming could soon cut out the need for theater releases altogether. But Given how costly it is to subscribe to every platform, the block booking practice is being forced onto consumers instead of cinema owners. Before, the problem was big studios deciding what people could watch at the cinema. Now, the problem is big studios deciding what people can watch at home. Another concern of old Hollywood practices is how stars were contracted. Did you ever wonder why Humphrey Bogart did so many detective stories? It's because he wasn't allowed to do anything else. Back then, being an actor was more of a day job. Like the scene in Hail Caesar by the Coen brothers, you could be working on a western picture in the morning and then asked to help out on a drama after lunch. Stores were forced to sign on for long shoots with grueling hours. At best, they could be loaned to another studio, but that was as close as they got to branching out, and if they refused, they were suspended without pay. No doubt this helped studios get productions made because it gave a degree of security. Stars would play the same type of characters in the same types of stories to the same types of audiences. That's why studios were against their hired stars experimenting with roles. It was the closest thing to an algorithm. Then came Olivia de Havilland. She got sick and tired of the terrible roles and working conditions that Warner Bros. was forcing her to take on. So she sued them for breach of labor laws. And she won. This overhauled the entire employment process of the American movie business overnight. But it seems the days of stars taking on the roles they want is coming to an end. Look at Marvel. Actors are hired indefinitely to play their comic book characters for as long as the House of Mouse decides. Though an actor might be able to take on a different script before resuming their next installment of their superhero franchise, the real problems are in the fine print. Social media presence didn't exist in Haviland's day, but now they are a tool for studios, not just for promotion, but also for control. Stars are forbidden from saying or doing things online or IRL that might shine a bad light on their big budget series. They can't use Twitter, Instagram, or even MySpace without first having the Marvel overlords make sure they are towing the party line. 
Add to that an expectation they will cameo in another franchise, and it seems the clocking and clocking out system of old is back in full swing. But the real downside of this is the death of the movie star. It's been pointed out by Quentin Tarantino and the Avengers own Falcon, Anthony Mackie, that audiences aren't coming to see the actors or actresses. They are coming to see Captain America and Spider-Man. People, going to the movies used to be an experience. It used to be a family affair. It used to be an event. Whereas now, you know, if people will go see movies just because they said it's going to be number one, and everybody know the movie's bad. No doubt the behind the scenes access Instagram and TikTok gives has diluted the star power of movie legends. So is it any wonder that the pull of the theater is now about the costume and not about the person wearing it? And if the actors don't like it, they'll risk future work. That's a big risk when you have a second vacation home to pay off. The third effect streaming will have if this trend continues is a stifling of independent voices. Though it's true that platforms like Mubi and Deeper Into Movies are holding the line when it comes to curating smaller films and lesser known releases, the part that a person's social media plays in their casting will restrict creativity. Take Sophie Turner. She came to fame from her performance as Sansa Stark in the HBO hit Game of Thrones. She revealed that she landed a part over a much more talented actress simply because she had a higher number of Instagram followers. This runs the risk that actors will be pigeonholing themselves to help commodify their careers long before they even get to act. This means the industry's reliance on algorithms and internet popularity will see talent lose roles to influencers. That means less risk, and less risk means less art, and less art means lower quality. Then we have the issue of content. No doubt you saw how the latest season of Stranger Things and the first season of Wednesday had scenes that felt a little bit too much like the creators were planning to splice these moments up for short form content. For some, this is an attempt to lengthen the production shelf life in a saturated world of options. For others, it's a sign that Hollywood is no longer taking the risks it once did. During the 90s, the water cooler chatter in any office was that summer's blockbuster, which more often than not was based off an original idea. But the spread of the internet has seen the gap between distribution windows shorten. Now, big shows are only big for that weekend. Now, big films are based on pre-existing IP. The CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings, admits that they aren't competing with other streaming platforms. They're competing with Fortnite, and Twitter, and your phone. Well, I'm here on the Warner Brothers lot, and it's going to be a big day for David Zaslav as he unveils the new combined streaming service, really the culmination of his year running the combined company. We expect uh, the company to unveil a new brand, exclusive content as well. They aren't in the market of films and TV. Their business model is attention. As algorithms take over and AI tools are refined, you may find yourself struggling to find original and daring works of art. So if you're sick of remakes, reboots, sequels, prequels, and spin-offs, then you're going to hate the future of streaming. But it's not all doom and gloom. Some believe that the return of the old Hollywood model could yield interesting benefits. For example, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and even Christopher Nolan predict the future role of the multiplex during the social media age will be a game changer. The running theory is that the cinema could again become a place of luxury if it's transformed into something that was culturally closer to the theaters of old. Usually, a movie cinema release is just a case of exhibition. But ever since Star Wars introduced merchandise, the industry shifted its profits generation to the distribution window. That's why we have toy tie-ins, fast food crossovers, and home video releases. So if streaming is narrowing the influence of the need for the screen, could multiplexes host classic movies for long runs in the same way that a Broadway show can play in the same space for decades? Imagine, you can see any new release you'd want at home. But when it comes to real movie magic like Jaws or Star Wars or Gone with the Wind, you would dress up to join a packed out audience at a multiplex. It would certainly help change the perception of paying for a ticket if the experience was taken more seriously. No doubt you've had the displeasure of being in an audience when people film their reactions. Audience reaction videos are a common fixture following a tentpole release, which means that some people are not going to the theater to enjoy a movie, but to create content. Could the cinema return to its intended purpose if streaming becomes the dominant platform for exhibition? Or has the prevalence of content creation contaminated the experience forever? That brings us to the last point. The earliest days of Hollywood really made films an experience of a lifetime. Gone with the Wind was in the cinema for four years, and it was estimated that half of America's population had seen it. Unless you stumbled upon a small theater replaying it, it meant that if you missed it, you missed it for good. That changed with the VHS, 
The video home system altered our relationship with movies forever, both in terms of the consumer perceptions and also the industry structure. The first VHS movie was the South Korean film The Young Teacher, which was filmed in 1970, released in 1972, and available on VHS in 1976, the same year that the format became available to customers. At the time, tapes cost $1,400, adjusting for inflation, that's almost $4,000. Though not immediately popular, they were able to beat their closest competitor, the Betamax, and reached their peak in the 90s. These, of course, would be replaced by the DVD, with the first release being Twister in Mars Attacks in 1997. Ten years later, Blu-ray emerged. The first releases in 2006's new format included 51st States and Hitch. In any case, the home video market meant consumers could own media. Yet today, sales of home media have plummeted. This is partly due to mediums becoming obsolete, as well as environmental considerations about the use of plastic. But this wouldn't be a problem if streaming platforms weren't already editing old releases. Netflix has gotten flack for altering scenes from Back to the Future. In addition, shows like Seinfeld and Friends are being broadcast in different format. At the time, they were shot in 4 to 3 to suit the common television. It made framing a human face more pleasurable for the eye, but blowing up the frame to fit the screen ratio of modern TV means that things which would be out of shot are now in full view. The consequence is consumers paying to watch things in ways they were not intended to be seen. The concern of lost media will become even bigger when physical formats eventually corrupt. It's already been said the original version of the Star Wars movies are gone, which means George Lucas's edited versions have now become the standard. And just recently, Disney wiped an entire movie from existence less than two months after it was released. And it was just to reduce their content assets to lower their tax bill. This just makes the return of Hays Code even more concerning. The Hays Code was a set of industry guidelines for self-censorship that was applied to most motion picture releases by the major studios. It dictated that sex not be shown on screen, which is why husbands and wives were shown sleeping in separate beds. It also put restrictions on profanity, depictions of crime and drugs, and even banned mocking religion. This type of censorship might seem daft by today's standards, so it's likely that modern sensitivities will be mocked in the future. But instead of self-censorship coming from industry documents, now self-censorship is coming from Twitter. Netflix and Disney are fronting shows with trigger warnings, and online outrage is pulling media or having it edited. Is that course correcting for history or eroding our consumer rights? Are these the complaints of the out of the touch, or is the new boss the same as the old boss? It's hard to say. But what we do know is all these things make it feel like the future of media consumption is taking us back to the past. Or is it? Whether you think this is a massive over-exaggeration or a terrible sign of things to come, share your predictions in the comments below. If you liked this video, be sure to check out our one on the historical guide to surviving cancel culture. Subscribe too, because we'll be back soon with a new video all about how history works.